Hi guys, welcome back to part two of our Tellum deep dive videos. If you haven't already, check out part one first, as some of the sections in this video will make a bit more sense if you have that context already. In this video, we're gonna continue our in-depth look at the design decisions and why some of those decisions were made. We're gonna start off with the damper shaft. Really straightforward part, but surprisingly important. We use a 10 millimeter diameter, hard chrome plated and micro finished solid steel shaft. When I say solid, it's drilled part way through for weight reduction but it does not have a rebound adjuster or anything going through the end. The hard chrome plating and finishing is actually extremely straightforward. Over the years, we've seen any number of alternative coatings. We've tested a few ourselves. None of them really went the distance as far as durability went, and that made hard chrome plating a very easy choice. Shaft diameter is more nuanced though. As a general rule with a twin tube shock, the smaller the shaft diameter, the better until you run into strength issues because it reduces the size of the reservoir you need by reducing oil displacement, reduces effective IFP friction, reduces weight, reduces gas charge force, and permits a higher gas charge, which is counterintuitively a good thing for durability. Given the propensity of frame designers to use shock extension yokes, also called clevises or strut mounts, ever since Specialized first introduced them to the market around 2010, strength is a real concern, however, and that means that for the 10 millimeter shaft, tell them there are limitations on how long of a yoke can be run. In the future, you can expect to see another variant of the Telum that uses a bigger damp shaft to handle the excessively long yokes that many bike designers somehow still keep building. Don't shoot the messenger. Anyway, shaft diameter has a less than obvious interaction with friction via the IFP. Because the IFP diameter is much larger than the shaft diameter, and because friction is a force, and because force is pressure times area, any oil pressure generated by the IFP's friction force is also enacted on the damper shaft's much smaller area to generate, in turn, a much smaller force. In this regard, the ratio of the respective areas of the shaft and IFP, which are related to the squares of the diameters, is what determines how much effective friction the IFP generates at the damper shaft. So why not just use a bladder? The only difference in performance between a bladder shock and an IFP shock, provided nothing else has changed, is friction. The shaft to IFP area ratio means that there is a massive reduction in the actual resistance to shaft motion that the IFP creates, because the oil pressure created by the seal friction is acting on a much smaller area. The IFP seal is not under any pressure delta because the IFP can simply move, so the seal isn't forced up one end of the groove, meaning its friction is actually fairly small to begin with at around two pounds in a low friction bore. With the 27 mm IFP and a 10 mm shaft, this is reduced by a factor of 7.29, which is 27 squared divided by 10 squared, when measured at the shaft, meaning about 0.27 pounds of friction at the shaft. The leverage ratio of the typical frame is somewhere around 2.6, which means that the frictional effect at the wheel, where it counts, is about 0.11 pounds. That's 0.27 divided by 2.6. That's about 50 grams of friction at the wheel. This is not even close to being a number worth chasing in our opinion, especially if it comes at the expense of quality and serviceability, which is the typical complication that arises from bladder shocks due to the much less precise control of the fluid volume during bleeding. Because that degree of friction is so tiny as to be well below the threshold of what people notice or what matters. Does that mean bladders are bad or silly? Absolutely not. They're cheaper to make than IFPs, which is good. And if you have a larger shaft diameter, then eliminating IFP friction starts to make more sense. They just aren't the best choice for this specific application. Let's take a look at the eyelet bearings. Generally unsexy part of the shock, but one of the things that has a massive impact on the behavior and durability of the shock. Wherever possible, we use these precision machine polymer spherical bearings made here to single digit micron tolerances to minimize rotational friction and handle misalignment. So we're reducing the side load on the more expensive wear parts of the shock such as the damp tube, seal head, piston, and shaft. We also offer standard cylindrical type eyelets like everyone else because for yoke bikes and a handful of others, these mounts are necessary. Anyway, the sphericals are particularly cool for a few reasons. First, because they isolate the tellum from side load by preventing axial misalignment, like so. Second, because using these polyurethane spaces, we're able to ensure that the tellum's eyelets aren't getting all twisted out of place due to spring torsion. And third, because they're actually bimodal. The pin rotates on the inner cylindrical surface of the spherical ball, and the outer surface of the spherical ball itself can rotate in the outer race to allow for that misalignment. Getting that dialed was a huge amount of development effort for something that looks ridiculously simple. Credit goes to Cascade Components for bringing the polymer spherical to the bike industry, and we've put our own refinements in with that license design with the isolators and the bimodal design. All right, let's have a dig into the main piston. This is a solid piston. No oil passes through it, but it does have a damping function as part of the hydraulic bottom out system. As the shock approaches full compression, in the last 15 millimeters, the main piston engages this cone and lock ring, which traps oil inside the piston and forces it up 
through a specific circuit inside the reservoir bridge, which is an orifice that's metered by the external hydraulic bottom mount adjuster needle. After the oil passes through that circuit, it re-enters the compression circuit ahead of the lockout piston, meaning it doesn't flow around the lockout or compression pistons, it has to flow through those two. The hydraulic bottom mount is highly effective and able to prevent harsh bottoming even on very big hits, which means you don't have to compromise your spring and damping rates elsewhere in the travel just to get bottoming protection even on very linear frames. Because it's a port orifice circuit, the harder you hit it, the more resistance you get, which means that in essence, your kinetic energy input, which is related to the square of the input velocity, self-calibrates against the energy dissipation of the HBO, which is also dependent on the square of the input velocity. Really though, no need to overthink this one. Uh, get it right once and you're good to go, since it really is completely independent of everything else that is happening in the shock. Anyway, as the talon begins to rebound and the HBO circuit wants to disengage, the HBO lock ring pulls slightly away from this surface here, which allows oil to refill the piston without cavitation or excessive noise. You'll see inside the piston here, we have these tapered ports that allow a progressive bypass so that the HBO can engage and disengage very smoothly. You won't notice it, you just won't notice it bottoming out either. On the outside of the main piston, you'll notice we have these two glide rings. One of these is a split ring, the other is an uninterrupted ring to minimize blow-by. In other words, to seal fully against the inner tube. These are PTFE infused and specifically and individually sized during the installation process so that they fit your damp tube with high precision and extremely low friction without having any axial play that leads to knocking during direction changes. What about stroke adjustment? Say you want to shorten a 65 mm stroke shock to 60 mm. On the Telum, it's achieved by offsetting the whole shaft and piston assembly upwards by 5 mm by introducing this spacer between the seal head and the retaining ring, which would sit under here. This maintains full engagement of the HBO when you reduce the stroke by 5 mm. The eye to eye length is maintained by installing a 5 mm longer eyelet on the end of the shaft. This can all be done without having to rebuild or rebleed the shock, but the IFP depth does need to be reset afterwards and the nitrogen charge refilled. For 2.5 mm stroke reductions, a thicker bumper plate can be installed. This does reduce HBO engagement from about 15 mm to about 12.5 mm. So now, let's take a look at the seal head. We've seen a lot of seal head designs over the decade or so that we were servicing other people's shocks, and frankly, some were better than others. It really doesn't matter how well your shock works if it doesn't currently work, so reliability was extremely important to us. Our seal head design is a combination of all the elements that we observed worked best in other shocks. A robust wiper to keep dirt out, under here, an offset bumper plate, this one here, to stop the bumper ramming dirt past the wiper, because when this bottom's out there, you've got clearance between this plate and the seal head, a large diameter shaft o-ring that can tolerate more surface damage and more contamination than many others without leaking, and support at both ends of the seal head to ensure it's able to maintain axial alignment even under side load. Thanks to the careful design of the seal head, damp shaft, and the main piston and inner tube, the Telum has very low friction as well. All right guys, that does it for this video on the mechanical design elements of the Telum so far. Check out the next video. We're gonna go into how we actually determine the most appropriate tune for you, what that looks like, how it is that we decide what tune to put you on.